Okay, good morning. Thursday, November 4, is our class session for multivariable calculus Delta College. So we get to show you some interesting things today. And we're finishing up our discussion of chapter five, which means we are getting ready for exam two. Exam two covers. Chapters four and five. This is all on our website, but I'm not thinking I'm going to go to the website right now. You can follow the schedule and you're getting used to the schedule. Uh, this is going to be distributed. As you hand in your next homework is Tuesday. November 9. This is going to be due one week later. And Tuesday, November 16. Uh, as far as dates go, and maybe I will pop to the website for just a second, you know, as we approach the end of the semester, be careful about the dates of the course. Let me say semesters 261. And I want to make sure everybody's looking at the same thing. So yeah, actually I've scrolled down to the bottom of the page. That's always a sign that something is about to end when you reach the bottom of the page. So here's next week, reviewing exam two, then chapter six is our third exam. And remember we're doing two chapters on an exam. Well, two and three chapters, four and five chapters, but this third exam is just about chapter six. So chapter six is the culmination of the calculus in many ways. So these are, very deep ideas, each one of them that we're going to focus on. We deliberately designed this so that the last exam covers these top level topics. But as this next exam goes from Tuesday to Tuesday, Tuesday to the following Tuesday, I need you to pay attention to the last week of the semester where I don't have a following Tuesday. In fact, I have to hand in grades on the following Tuesday. So I haven't set in stone when this third exam is going to be, but it's not likely going to be Tuesday to Tuesday. It's more likely to be uh, Friday to Friday or Saturday to Saturday, because really the exam has to end in that week, because I have to submit grades immediately the following next week. So we have a pattern. We have a process. You guys are doing it very nicely, but I'm going to have to slightly tweak that pattern for this last exam. So uh, we'll mention it as we come to it. I just wanted to give you a heads up before we even start to worry about that. Okay, so everything else will follow our normal pattern. So what we want to look at today. If we dived all the way into it, would be mass, center of mass, moments of inertia. We gave a brief description of mass and center of mass last time, and we want to do some examples now. Uh, from moments of inertia, there's something called radii of gyration. And all of these things are physical topics that we are applying calculus to. So I think they're important, most of all, first, because they're physical topics. They're actually descriptions of reality. But to me, the most exciting thing is how effectively you can apply the calculus to it. And what we're teaching in this course is the calculus. I do not want to jump into the physics 
of center of mass or moments of inertia. I will kind of leave that to your physics or engineering instructors. In fact, I'm not assigning you a problem to calculate moments of inertia. And I would be unlikely to do that on an exam too. I mean, to me, these are all one calculation. If you can do a center of mass problem, you can do a moments of inertia problem. And the interpretation is important, but it's not central to what we're doing. I'm satisfied if we talk about mass, center of mass and the interpretation of those. So I'll let you read his examples about moments of inertia, which he does a fair job of explaining nicely. You can compare them to other books, but I only wanna do a couple examples of mass and center of mass with you. Now inside those, I want to remind you that you have at one time studied integration techniques. And sometimes people make the mistake of figuring, oh, but my calculator, I mean, long before there was a Mathematica, your calculator could easily perform definite integrals. Uh, my calculator does definite integrals. Mathematica does definite integrals and even does them symbolically. You know, why do I need these integration techniques? Well, you need them in a sense because you can be faster than the machine if you understand what the appropriate techniques are. And that sounds silly at first, faster than machine, that's ridiculous. The machine takes a thousandth of a second. No, 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 even typing it in takes 10, 20, 30 seconds. And you could be done before that. So I'm not here to preach back to the horse and buggy. I'm not here to preach that we should all raise our own food with stone knives and bear skins. But I do want you to understand that there's a value to understanding some of the basic integration techniques because they make you able to manipulate things much more quickly and add common sense to your calculations much more easily sometimes than using a machine. I understand when you get to some actual applications, you're gonna be continuously using machines to evaluate and test the things you're working on. But you also have to have a common sense, a feeling about what you're doing when you're integrating. So, I'm going to say a word about this. And the meaning of integration. And I will build this into these one of these two examples I'm presenting right here. Okay, but after that, the main topic for today is change of variables. in multiple integrals. And if you wanted to explain this to someone who had only taken Calc 1, you want to explain this to the person on the street, the average person on the street, you want to explain it to your little brother, little sister, aunt, uncle, who hasn't done calculus before. That's a little bit difficult, although we could give her a shot. Let's just say you had someone who had just taken a calculus one class, what does it mean to change variables in multiple integrals? Well, I'm gonna to say to them that, do you remember U substitution? So, yes, U substitution, that was fun. So, well, what we're gonna teach you how to do is do U substitution in space, U substitution in multiple integrals. And so this is very, very powerful. But again, it relates back to integration techniques because you can take an exotic region or an exotic solid. And if you recast how it's described, you can turn it into a very simple solid. And that sometimes eliminates the need for integration at all. So the integration techniques you learned were not about necessarily performing integration, they were about sometimes getting out of work. Mathematics is not about work. 
Mathematics is about getting out of work. It's about using techniques to speed calculations. Although we do have a lot of fun just performing random funny calculations. Okay, so this is the goal today. And so I'm gonna begin it with just a small observation. And this is not gonna be impressive to anyone, but let's practice some very simple integrals. And I saw this on the homework, I saw some things here, so I wanted to mention them. Let's integrate five from zero to seven along the x-axis. I know you could write this as five times x. I know you know how to integrate five, that five times x, the derivative is five. I know you, how you, I know you know how to plug in seven and zero and give me the response of 35. But truly, if you were evaluating this integral, all I want you to say is 35. Because you and I both see this brick. That's how I've used the word, this brick that is five units wide. Sorry, I got it backwards. Five units tall and seven units wide. So now I'm not to scale anymore. And all I'm asking for is the area. So remember our favorite saying, our mantra, an integral, a definite integral is either a length, an area, volume, or the contribution of a function there too. So this definite integral is an area. And you can take that everywhere. This definite integral is also an area. And so when you have to evaluate this, I don't want you to say, oh, that's one half x squared, blah, 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 let's put in the seven, stuff like that. I just want you to say one half of 49. 49 over two, uh, 24.5, either way you wanna say that, because you know that this is a triangle. that's seven by seven. And you know the volume or the area of a triangle is one half base times height. But again, that works for any triangle. So now if I said the integral from zero to four of uh, three X plus five, now I want you to visualize that I have three X plus five, which is a line with a positive slope I don't want to get too serious about what line. So I'm just going to draw some representation over here. And this is a trapezoid, right? Which is made out of a rectangle and a triangle. And the rectangle is five units high because that's the intercept. And the triangle has a slope of three. So now if I just use my volume intuition, the volume, or sorry, my area intuition, what's the area of this object? Well, it's four times five is 20, plus one half the area of that triangle. What's the base of that triangle? Four. What's the height of that triangle? Is it 12? I mean, it's the height of the triangle only. I know it starts at five, but as I go to X here, I get 12 plus five, I know I get up to 17, but the triangle is just four by 12. So the area of this integral right here is just 44. And if we evaluate it, three X squared plus five X, three halves X squared plus five X from zero to four. And if we plugged in zero, we'd get nothing. And if we plugged in four, we'd get 16 times three halves. Okay, that's 24 plus 20, that's 44. So it's good to run the machine. It's good to be able to run the machine, but it's almost better to know what things represent. Let me take it to another level in two different ways. 
Now notice I'm only talking about single integrals right here, but I could apply this to my generic knowledge of volumes too, which we'll do presently. But let's say I want you to integrate from zero to two, four minus x squared dx. Now that required a particular technique. You're dealing with sums and differences of squares. You learned a special technique for that in calculus two, a special u substitution, u equals two sine theta. And I'm, I'm not gonna even go through that substitution. You can execute it, you can practice executing it. But what you really wanna do is say, oh, this is y equals zero to y equals two. This is a curve, y equals four minus x squared. I'm talking about height, y axis. <coughs> and now I'm evaluating the area of a part of a circle of radius two. From zero to two on the x-axis, excuse me, integrating with respect to x, and the height from zero to four minus x squared, we discussed last time how that is immediately recognizable as a circle. So now we say, oh, well, I know what the area of a circle is. Area of a circle is pi r squared. And so this is a quarter of a circle. So it's quarter. So this integral, you should just immediately say is pi. Okay, so don't neglect your geometry. And last time I in, introduced this one extra idea about not neglecting your geometry, and that was sines and cosines. So be wise about your use now of sines and cosines. So I tried to evaluate sine x with respect to x from zero to pi. And I told you last time that that's one node of sine. Well, you knew that this was one node of sine, but I'll tell you that one node of sine is always an area of two units, a node of the unadulterated, the unmodified sine or cosine, one node is two square units. So if you ever saw this expression, I don't want you to say, I don't mind if you say, where does sine come from? Let's anti-differentiate, let's plug in pi and zero. No, I just want you to say, oh, that's two. That bump is worth two. Now let's do the same thing for sine squared. And now how do I evaluate sine squared? Oh, what trigonometric identity is that? And so on and so forth. You learned one day uh, from your cosine of two theta formula. You can express cosine of two theta in three ways. Cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. Two cosine squared theta minus one, or one minus two sine squared theta. And you can use this identity as a way to replace sine squared or cosine squared. If I solve these for sine squared and cosine squared, what I get are two famous identities you may have used in calculus. And that is cosine squared is one half plus one half cosine two theta. And sine squared is one half minus one half cosine two theta. In, the, in other words, they're exactly the same. Now they have a very convenient format. One of them's plus and one of them's minus. How do you ever remember things in pairs? It helps to remember things in pairs, but how do you remember which one is minus? I just say, you know, sinus minus. That is absolutely silly, but I never forget that sign. But how does this relate to what you and I want to do? Well, then I want to evaluate sine squared one half minus one half cosine two theta. And, oh, okay, I've changed to theta from X. I hope you don't mind that, but that's just naming variables. Now, a word about that in a second. Now you say you've traded one trig integral for another. 
but you admit I made this trig integral easier. I can tell you what the antiderivative of minus cosine is faster than I can tell you what the antiderivative of sine squared is. But I say the improvement is even more dramatic because let's think about this. Cosine of two theta has two waves in two pi. So cosine two theta looks kind of like this. And I can't draw my cosine wave nicely, I apologize. What is this two called? This two is called angular frequency. Two waves in two pi units. That's the purpose of angular frequency. But that means in one pi units, this cosine wave does a full wave. And remember, I'm just referring to cosine two theta in here, not the minus one half. You know how to deal with the minus one half. The minus flips it upside down. The one half shrinks it by one half, but it doesn't change the geometry. So you know now that the integral from zero to pi of cosine two theta is what? Zero, natural zero, because it's a full period. So do you see how you're going to evaluate this? Because of this transformation, because of the nature of cosine two theta over the interval zero to pi, you get to say, I don't care about that. That sums to zero. And now what do I have? A brick of area pi over two. Now, these are just three small, well, a couple small examples, but I want to do more example here in a second of how to apply this at a higher power. But never, never feel ashamed about using geometry. Never do a messy integral when a simple geometric argument will do but you do have to be prepared to do integrals. Okay, next thing I want to say about the two homeworks you're currently working on, the one you submitted Tuesday and the one you're submitting today, uh, the napkin ring problem, drilling a hole through a sphere. You did that, you know, decently and, you know, mostly always correct. Sometimes get people get bothered when some people throw variables into the problem and you say, you can't use that variable. That's the variable I was gonna use for integration. So I need you to learn to be flexible in that. So sometimes when you did that problem about the napkin ring, sometimes you went a little bit overboard in redefining the variables. Work with the variables you have. If you wanna bring in variables of integration, you can change those, but uh, not that it stopped you, but it might have unnecessarily complicated your work if you go about renaming things too much. Sometimes it pays to rename things. And now the last word before we get started is about this wonderful rocket comp that you're currently working on. So finished it, not finished it, I don't mind. This is not a scale drawing, but you have something like a rocket cone, which is composed of a piece of a cone, right circular cone, symmetry about the vertical, and a piece of a sphere. And from a very bare description, this is four, and this is the square root of three, and this sphere is radius one. I want you to, oh, and one more thing, which is essential, the sphere is tangent to the cone. Now, what's interesting about this problem, I'm trying to get you to expand your horizons interesting about this problem is in fact the way I stated it with radiuses and diameters I didn't use any variables and I didn't describe the dimensions other than in the barest way 
but I did give you enough to work out the dimensions. So what is gonna happen when you come into the quote unquote real world and someone asks you to work out the volume or the center of mass of something, they're not gonna hand you a telephone pole that's neatly painted and labeled with R's and H's and densities. You know, they're gonna hand you a physical object with a simple description and you're going to have to fit your tools to the object. So you need to get used to taking a physical object and a physical description such as this and making a fair drawing so that you can work out what's the height, what's the radius, what's the angle, what's the blank, what's the blank. So your physical objects come to you often as nature has produced them and not with beautiful, well-labeled edges and heights and bases. So you can, if you make a nice picture of this, work out exactly how high it is, what the angles are, what the intersection points are. But that's a skill I want you to bring to the problem. You need to work out the labels, dimensions, and limits of integration. And you're doing that, or some of you have already done it. I'm just saying, you know, you should be able to work these things out from the description. Okay, now let's move over to a basic center of mass problem. I'm not gonna go one dimensional, I'm gonna go strictly two dimensional and then three dimensional, but I have this plan. And if we were in class with physical things in front of us, I would simply take a piece of cardboard and cut it into some irregular shape and balance it on the tip of my finger. But right now you're gonna to have to do this with a thought experiment. So I'm gonna say, here's an irregular piece of cardboard that I've cut out or in two dimensions, X and Y. And how would I balance this? Well, I would kind of balance it horizontally. And I'm not saying I know where this is. It's irregular, let's say, this is the place where I've got equal left and right mass. You say, I don't know, this, this side looks larger, right? Maybe the density here is greater. And then I would try to balance it vertically. And I might decide that that ends up about right there. And if I do this correctly, then what I end up with right here is the center of mass literally the place at which I would put my finger or put a tiny cone fulcrum to balance this sheet of cardboard on. And that center of mass has coordinates X center of mass, Y center of mass. Uh, sometimes people write X bar, Y bar. And the coordinates of that we described last time, X bar is double integral, let's call this region R, R, X, D, M, R, D, M, and the Y is R, Y, D, M, R, D, M. Now we gave other symbols to these, M, that's the mass. And this was called the moment about the y axis. Now let's think of where x bar is. x bar is right here. And what we're looking for is the balance place with respect to the y axis. So you're trying to set a vertical line to balance the sheet on. And the vertical line is not the y axis, at least the way I've described this but it's gonna be a translation of the y-axis. So we call this 
numerator here, xdm, this is a little bit weird, you gotta get used to it, xdm is the moment about the y-axis. Frankly, I like to avoid using that word. I like to avoid using the MY notation. I just go straight to the, here's how we do it. X bar is X DM over DM. Same thing for here. The Y center of mass is the moment about the X axis. It's the parallel line to the X axis that tells you where to balance. But this language persists into moments of inertia and things like that, which we're not gonna dig into. But so in your physical classes, physics and engineering, you might have to actually get more familiar, more comfortable with these words. So let's do a problem. I want to do, I just picked a very mellow first problem out of the book and I wanna make sure Good, got it. Let's look at problem 308 in section 5.6 to illustrate these. And, and what I wrote here is easily extensible to space except there'll be triple integrals and there'll be three pairs of triple integrals. Notice this is not four integrals because the mass on the bottom is the same for both X bar and Y bar. And the same would be if we went to triple integrals. Also notice one more thing, this DM right here, which we call the little bit of mass, that's almost worth writing down. Well, that's just, I like to say it that way, you know, it's dm, infinitesimal mass. What is that equal to? A little bit of area times the density or the mass per unit area. This is the mass per unit area, delta. And this is the area, dA the little bit of area. I scrawled that a little too small, but the little bit of mass is equal to the density times the little bit of area. Density here could be constant or it could be a function that depends on X and Y. We'll do an example with function depends on X and Y. And the other thing I wanna say is uh, free, people frequently use rho for density, but I don't want to use that right now because of our using rho and spherical coordinates. So I don't know if I'm terribly consistent about this in my handouts and sample problems, but we're going to use delta. So here we go. We want to draw a picture and cut out a region in space and I'll draw the picture for you. It goes from one, one, two, one. And it goes two, two, and one half, and two, and one. A kind of an irregular shape here. This is the curve x times y equals one. This is the curve x times y equals two. So I'll write this down carefully in a second, but first I wanted to draw it. Excuse me, let me move my paper and label the paper effectively. So this is one, two, one, two, y-axis, x-axis. And this region R is bounded by x times y equals one, x times y equals two. And those are, by the way, hyperbolas. So here's x times y equals one, x times y equals two. And y equals one, 
and y equals two. So what I wanna know is what's the center of mass of this region. Now, if this has a constant density, people call the center of mass centroid, kind of the center of the object, but let's assign a different density to this just for fun and practice. And the problem assigns four X plus four Y, or as he writes in the book, four times X plus Y. And the problem does say rho, and I'm gonna say delta. So what I have here is a object that's getting more dense as I move away from the origin. Now think about this, X plus Y is a line with slope negative one. X plus Y equals one, X plus Y equals two, X plus Y equals three. So four times X plus Y means as I slide this line of slope negative one across this region, it gets denser as I go out. That's the physical meaning of this. So somehow my, if you were to take a pen and just mark the center of this, that's one thing. What you believed was the physical center. But when I do center of mass here, mass and center of mass, I'm going to have center of mass be slightly distorted towards the out. I could have drawn this picture larger. We'll do that in a second. So now let's work up mass. Mass is integral of the region, the dm, which is integral over the region of the delta dA. And so I'm going to describe this object with respect to the coordinate system I choose, and I'm going to insert that delta. And then I'm going to work out the moment about the y-axis, which I said I wouldn't use that language, but I'll just say x dm which is inserting an X delta dA. And the moment about the X axis, which is what happens when I insert Y. And he gives a fair, uh, I, I, he gives a nice way of stating why we use that notation in the book. So I don't mind that, but I'll let you read that. Y delta dA. And then once I have these things, I divide, find the mass and the center of mass. In this problem, I believe he only asked you for the mass, but why don't we just do the mass and the center of mass for the whole thing? Okay, got it. And then I wanna show you some interesting automations after that. So here we go. Uh, the mass is R delta dA. Well, now I'm gonna to have to choose how I want to shoot this thing. I'm gonna choose how I want to describe this thing. And even though these curves are irregular on the left and right, I do have it nicely blocked off on the y-axis from one to two. So I don't think coordinates, rectangular coordinates are gonna be bad. Let's at least give it a shot. Let's integrate from one to two for y. And then let's integrate with respect to x. And we're integrating four times x plus y. So what I need to do now is set the X limits as I shoot through here. Where do I enter? Described in terms of X. Where do I exit? Described in terms of X. And I go to these core curves. X, Y equals one means X equals one over Y is where I enter. Once I've picked out a Y and X equals two over Y is where I exit once I've picked out this Y. I don't know, maybe that will bother me that I'm using reciprocals here, but let's find out. So I'm going to integrate first with respect to X. Maybe I should have left it in the four X plus four Y format, but there's no harm in switching back. So I got my X squared times two. When I differentiate, that'll give me four X. And then I have my four X Y. When I differentiate that with respect to X, I'll get four Y. And I'm gonna do this from X equals one over Y to X equals two over Y. And remember, I named these just so I put the one over Y and the two over Y into the correct slots. And uh, then I'm gonna run Y from one to two. 
So now we'll see how nasty this is going to be. What I get is 4 times 2, 8 over y squared. I think I can handle that power of y integral. What I get right here, when I plug in 1 over y, I get 4. I think I can handle that. So this integration is not distracting at all. So where does 8 over y squared comes from? Comes from 8 over y, negative. If you want to re render this as negative exponents, that's fine with me. But remember that when you differentiate y to the minus 1, you get minus y to the minus 2. So that would produce the 8 over y squared. And then you get 4y. And then I evaluate that from one to two. So what do I got is a minus four plus eight. Subtract, now here's putting in one, I actually get something here. Minus eight plus four. So look, if these are gonna cancel out. No, actually they're always opposites of each other here. It's kind of a fun symmetry. What I get is 8 plus 8 is 16. And negative 4 minus 4 is negative 8. So the mass of this object is 8 units. We did not talk about what units we were using. He didn't bring units. So we'll just call them 8 mass units, kilograms, ounces, grams, whatever your favorite mass units are. OK, now we're going to execute the other two integrals. But I'm also going to think about how I want to do this wisely. So I don't want you to totally shun calculational devices. So we might move to a calculational device here. But let's at least write the moment about the y-axis, which was the xdm, which was x delta dA. Go through the progression in your mind whenever you write one of these, which was, now x times delta would be 4x squared plus 4xy. And we were successful with this limits before. So let's stick with them. Now, I don't think that this is going to be any more difficult for me to integrate, although extra variable is going to do some extra powers. Maybe I should just try it. But I don't think I'll try both of them. I think I'll have to automate at least one of these. But I'm just curious if this presents me with any extra difficulties. So I'm going to say 4 thirds x cubed, integrating with respect to x, and then 2x squared y, evaluating from x equals 1 over y to x equals 2 over y. And then integrating from one to two after that. And I don't think this is bothering me, but it's adding extra work that I'm not enjoying. Maybe that's the time I'm gonna to start to automate it, but I get eight over y cubed, 32 over three, one over y cubed. And here I get four over y squared, kilo y, four over y, eight over y. Oh, that's interesting. Now that's going to be the first integral that I can't do on my fingers and toes. That involves a famous integral formula I know. So what do I got here? I got y to the minus 2, 1 over opposite. And I differentiate this, I get minus 2 come. I'm going to kill that 2. So I get 16 over 3. So I'm just doing the power rule in reverse here. So when I differentiate this, I get 32 thirds y to the minus 3. And here I get the 8 log y. I'm continuing this in evaluation because I want to make a point. OK, something happened. Something happened. Someone, I apologize for that. My video was interrupted because someone tried to call me on the telephone. And right now the telephone is my document camera. OK, so you might have to recover what we've written right here. So now let's evaluate this from 1 to 2. 
when I plug in two, I get four down here. So I get minus one fourth, get minus four thirds and plus eight log two. When I plug in one, I get minus 16 thirds, eight log one, of course, log one is zero. So I get minus 16 thirds and I'm subtracting. So how does this come out? This is 16 thirds minus four thirds, which is 12 thirds, which is four. And I get this awkward eight log two. So as much as I try to escape technology, sometime I'm going to have to deal with some number that I have not memorized. Now I could say that log two is 0.693 because maybe you use log two frequently, right? But you don't go about memorizing all the natural logarithms. So if I times it by eight and add four, let's assume that I'm doing this fairly incorrectly. That's about 9.45. And let's check in this out. My mass was up here at eight. So what does that make my X bar? I could simplify before I pull out the calculator, but I just have one half plus log two. Log two again is about 0 0.693, 0 0.5, 0 0.693. What do we got? 1.193 approximately. And we will confirm that so we don't do anything silly. 1.193 and going on forever. Let's pull our image back here and look at where 1.193 is. First, you think it's too small, but X bar 1.193, we might be talking about in this area right here. Now, I don't know, that's not, that's not good or bad. That just is my X bar. I haven't worked out my why Y bar is. Somehow I think my Y bar should shade down towards the bottom. And this Y here was just a Y marker. So, what am I going to say now before we go on? Because we need to get to eventually a break. This was fun. It was good exercise. But all I'm doing is repeating the same integral with slightly modified integrands. This screams for automation. This screams for setting up something very visual that I can play with in Mathematica. So after giving you a speech, how you should be able to do all the integrations with sticks and pebbles when your fingers and toes, now I need to do what? I, I kind of need to honestly automate this in a machine. I'm going to pull up Mathematica window. I'm gonna share it with you and show you how we could on, automate this in a fruitful way. And then we'll take a break. So here we go, Mathematica, get me a document and then I'll share it with you. So let me also, what am I gonna do right here? I want to get the type size up a little bit for you, and then I'll share screen. So let's move on with this. Let's make this uh, exercise 308, section. Um, and I might share this document with you here, 5.6. That's just some words to I typeset. And the first thing I'm going to do here is put in the delta. Oh, 
let's define delta as a function. Ask yourself, why am I doing that? The function is four times x plus y. Okay, but after that, it's gonna be just integration, integration, integration. So when I did the delta dA, what I did was integrate it. So let's say mass is integrate, integrate. Remember, I do this by the command line and I also do this the old way. If you wanna write one integration, you go right ahead. I just like to see the iterated integral. And now instead of typing 4x plus y, I'm gonna type delta of x comma y. And I'm gonna do that first from x equals one over y to two over y. And then I'm gonna do that result from y, I've got a missing brace right there, from uh, one to two. So I'm gonna show you a valid way to automate this in a second. So let me just make sure I got everything going on. I don't wanna do any serious indentations here. So I'm just gonna evaluate this. And I got seven and not eight. Okay, so now I'm gonna have to go back and find out what's up with the seven and not eight here. So did I do something odd with this? Four X plus Y, one over Y, two or Y, one to two. Did I screw up with the one to two? If you see something obvious, you can throw it in the chat. But this is one reason why you check things, right? So. I've typed in what I wanted to type in. I've typed in my delta. So why do I believe that this is seven and not eight? I'm gonna go back to my paper for a second. We were right here. We have our region, we have our limits from one to two. We evaluate this, we have first, eight over y squared, then we have eight. Is this eight right here? Is this an eight itself right here? When I plug in two over y, is this eight x? What am I missing? Is this simply an eight? Well, let's see if that works out. When I plug in, oh, okay. So did I not finish the inserting of this in here? So I get eight over y squared good, then I get eight. And did I fail to plug in the one over y? That looks like what's happened. Two over y squared. And four. So six over y squared plus four. And this is minus six. And we hope that this is correct over four. So now we got right here, what? Minus three plus eight and you put in the ones and you get minus six plus four. And then you're subtracting. And so you get negative three plus six is three and you get eight minus four is four. Okay, so there's another reason to use technology. And after preaching how to integrate, I should make sure I know how to integrate. Well, see, now what am I faced with right there? Now I'm faced with double, double guessing myself on this one, right? So I just discovered that was seven. 
am I going to discover that this integral is wrong? Well, let's type it in and find out. I'm going to type it in to the same integral I executed a second ago. Except now to do the my, I can take the same integral. This is the first step in the automation. And I can do what? X times delta X, same limits. Seven halves log 64. Now, eight log two is log 64 because of the power rules. Two to the eighth is 64. And here I get seven halves. So this is almost interesting, almost match what we did. Seven halves divided by seven is one half. And eight log two over seven, eight sevenths log two, Let's go work this out. So 0.5 plus eight divided by seven log two, 1.29. See the error wasn't very large or detectable. Unless I had double checked, I might've thought I was pretty close to the truth, but I didn't know why it wasn't working out. So now let's do the same integral, but just call it mx and substitute a y in here. Six plus log 64. And now let's do my divided by m and mx divided by mass. Put that in a list and get some crazy number. But if we want to make a numerical argument out of it, remember n bracket, there's my center of mass. Now, how should I automate this? I think what I want to do is have these three integrals executed all at once. And let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that, and that, and that. Then I want to have the center of mass executed at the same time. This is not the automation. But the reason I want to do that is because now, okay, and now let's just say I'm excited about the mass and the moments, but I don't want those reported. So I suppress the reporting of those. So now I've built something that only gives me the center of mass here. But why did I do that? Because now I can alter the delta and I can have a new center of mass. Numerically computed. Now let's take this to be a sine of y. This would be a horrid thing to compute by hand. But now I see the coordinates here. Notice you should make sure your delta is not a negative number, which we've done. But the reason I'm going to do this is because I can create a nice graphic with this. Let's try, and then we're going to have to take a break. And maybe, maybe I should do this. Since I'm not going to, I don't want to overuse time, I will create a graphic while we take a break. And you can hang out and watch me create the graphic, but I'd rather you stretch your legs and relax. Let's come back at 9.07 AM. But I want to create some kind of interactive graphic where I can always see the center of mass changing. I'm going to mute my microphone, and I'll come back but you guys just relax and stretch your legs for a second.
Okay, I'm back. And I'm just going to share the screen with you because I made a nice little graphic. And then we're going to move on to what we <coughs> really have to do today. But maybe this is not a bad illustration of creating an interactive graphic. So let's go back to sharing screen. Let's look at this expression. And let me do some copying and pasting. And I don't need that. I don't need that. Let's see what happens when we execute. So what I've got is I can define delta to be anything I want now. And now I've written double integral for, inter for mass, moment about the y-axis, moment about the x-axis. Did I copy that incorrectly? So let's look at that. Let's look at that. So did some cut and paste issues right there. And then I plotted the lamina as a region plot and the center of mass as just a point plot. And I can show the lamina in the center of mass. So after I select my delta, I get a graphic that tells me the center of mass and shows me the location of that center of mass. Now you say that's a little bit shaded out here. Well, it's shaded out because I gave more weight to the points. I gave more mass to the points that were farther away from the origin. If I had just set this equal to a constant of one, there's the true centroid of that object. But as I change the weight of points, what if I wanted to greatly weigh points that were for higher y values? And uh, let me see if I can do this without scrolling too much. Now that point is creeped up here, even though there's less area up here, but I'm greatly weighing the y values. Let's incredibly weigh the y values. Okay, now that point curls up to here, right? So this is the center of mass if the density is shaded way up to the top. I could improve this graph even by doing what? Maybe I should color this region by the density I'm using. So you can see where the density is. I could do that. I don't want to do the looking up through the documentation to spend the time on that right now. But what I'm trying to show you here is if you define something to be a function, you can change that function. You can have your set of calculations and graphics all set up to incorporate that new function. And then you could just by one click, check out the effect of executing new functions. We could even change this into a manipulate, but I'd have to basically manipulate on a parameter what happens as I increase the power of y. I don't know if I want to do that right now, but let's, it's like a moth to a flame. I have to see that. So let's say a underscore. Let's say I'm going to weight this lamina based on powers of y. And that means I'm going to have a mass that depends on a, this is the reason why I shouldn't do this. And then I'm going to have, because I have to alter everything, and I have that, and I have that. Then I have the delta depending on A. I think that this could crash and burn, but we're gonna have to find out. And then I have this depending on A and A. 
A and A. The region thankfully stays the same. The center of mass then depends on A. The only problem is simply renaming all these things to be functions. I'm not sure if that's going to be the most effective way to do this, but let's give it a shot. What if we let delta depend on A? No problem. Now we let the mass depend on A in that fashion through delta, that should not be a problem. Now we let the center of mass depend on these definitions, that should not be a problem. Lamina unchanged should not be a problem. Center of mass, we're gonna take this stuff again right here and insert it right here. That should be okay, I'm hoping. Now for the show, not just like this, let's try show based on a simple power of two. Uh, zoom, 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 zoom. So it's angry about something right here. It doesn't like this expression right here. It doesn't want to evaluate that to a numerical. Okay, I'm okay with that. It doesn't want to evaluate that. Okay, so I was going for a manipulate command I'd have to first find out what happens to the center of mass at a given power of two, and it's not liking that. So that's the error. Oh, I did not call that a variable. Let's see if that fixes people. Doesn't seem to fix people. So, I do not think I should investigate this with any time here. If I could see how to alter this. I would do it. And I don't see anything obvious. So I shouldn't spend time on doing it. There's something wrong here. You see, by evaluating this A, it's not sure what to do with this A when I set the masses and center of masses here. And if you saw it, you could chime in. Uh, what you describe in Mathematica is you have to be careful about the order of integration. Sometimes it looks opposite. So. Uh, you're right about that. Be careful about that. But uh, ah, this is so close. I wish I could just see obviously what was wrong here. Let me copy this. Take it down here. Evaluate that and then evaluate that. Something, it's not processing the number here I put in for the A. And I do not know why. If I can come up with a better description of that and I just have to let it be. Maybe what I should do is eliminate that entirely and only use it down here. That's not happening. Okay, this is not gonna happen right now. I apologize. But what I was gonna do is create an animation where as I slid the A, the center of mass would slide up and down in this lamina. We could easily do that. I'm just missing some syntax or presentation right here. If I do this later and come up with a good illustration, I'll post it to the list. I'll post it to the group, but right now I'm gonna stop sharing it. Okay. So it's fun to play with mass, center of mass, moment of inertia and such, 
but it's just an application of what we're doing. And we need to move on to something else. But we'll use the piece of that example we just did in an interesting way, I think. Okay, so remind you how you changed integration in the most, most common sense. And that is when you changed integration by u substitution. You know, very first u substitutions looked like this, and I want to integrate from zero to pi over two let's say on one of these or both of these. And you know where cosine came from, but you didn't know where cosine of two X came from. So you said, well, I'm gonna recast this by saying U equals two X, DU DX equals two, or DU is equal to two times DX. Whether you were a person who replaced the two times X, or said dx is one half du. I don't mind, but you literally recast this integral as cosine of u and dx was one half du. And then if you were to change the limits of integration, if x is zero, u is zero, since this is a simple linear case, I am allowed to do this without any fear. Usually I'd put back what the x is at the end. And if x is equal to pi over two, then u is equal to pi. And what you ended up saying is, the integral of cosine two X from zero to pi over two is worth the same as the one half of the integral from zero to pi cosine U du. Now that's not super duper impressive because the integral of cosine from zero to pi is strictly zero, right? Same area above and below. So one half of zero is just zero. Let me go back up to here. Maybe I should investigate what this looked like. Well, this is two cosine waves and two pi. This is one cosine wave and pi. So if I do one cosine wave and pi, this whole expression, from zero to pi over two should be zero because this matches the area there. Well, the fact that it turned out to be zero is not exciting, but what I did was legitimate. One half of zero is still zero. What was more interesting to me is this one half. To recast this integral, to perform, this U substitution, what did I have to do? I had to take the interval on the x-axis from zero to pi over two, and I had to recast it as an interval on another axis, a U-axis, from zero to pi. And literally what I said when I changed my X to my U's is I'm integrating literally over twice the length. Now you don't always have this linear substitution, but integrating over twice the length, I had to pay for that switch. And the pain for that switch was the size of du dx. du dx equals two means I magnified 
that expression. I magnified this interval by two units. So to switch from dx to du dx, what did I have to do? I had to get rid of that magnification that I performed. So I say du dx is two. So to switch from x's to u's, I had to multiply du dx by dx. I had to multiply that dx by a factor of two. So the du is two times dx. Now, as I said, whether you said du is two times dx or you replace dx is one half du, that doesn't matter. Either I put a two inside here and a one half out front, or I just write the one half there. This one half was the price for changing from x to u. It was the cost of the u substitution. If you like, you could think of that one half. How do you change dx into du? You could think of that one half as dx du instead of thinking the two is the du dx. This was the price for switching from x to u, from switching to this coordinate system in x, which wasn't terrible, but the first time you saw this, you weren't sure what to do with the two, to switching to this coordinate system in u, which you had memorized the integral of cosine was sine. And then you can evaluate it. So what we're interested in is how do I describe that price of changing if I had more variables? What if I had dx dy and I wanted to change it to dr d theta? Well, we know that the cost is the r. I gave you a geometric argument for that r here. But could I describe how that r was produced? How did we produce the r? And the thing that produced the r let me get ready to move my paper up. Excuse me. The thing that produced the R is an extension of this derivative here, but it's gonna to have to involve multiple variables. The thing that produced the R here is called the Jacobian. I'm gonna to have to switch to X to U. I had to relate X and U and I switch from X and Y to R and theta. I'm going to have to relate r and theta derivative wise. I know how to relate r and theta to x and y in coordinates. How do I relate r and theta to x and y by derivative? And it's got a funny notation. It's called the partial of x and y with respect to r and theta. So it's a combination of partial derivatives because I'm dealing with multiple variables here. And I'm not differentiating with respect to x and y and r and theta at the same time. This is a symbol for what we call the Jacobian. It's a shorthand for take the partial derivative x with respect to r, take the partial derivative of x with respect to theta, take the partial derivative of y with respect to r, and take the partial derivative of y with respect to theta, 
And then with this matrix right here, you take the determinant of this matrix, which is the product of the main diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal in this case. This is called the Jacobian. Take the absolute value of that. Well, not, not we're not gonna take the absolute value yet. This determinant is called the Jacobian. So now let's execute this for the polar switch. Let's say X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta. This is called the Jacobian for the R theta transformation. So partial X, partial R is cosine theta. Partial X, partial theta is R sine theta minus. Partial Y, partial R is sine theta. Partial Y, partial theta is R cosine theta positive. The determinant of that, which we sometimes describe with absolute value bars, but I'm gonna to have to take the absolute value beyond that, is R cos squared theta, and then subtract this direction, determinant of a matrix, A, B, C, D. It's got a lot of notation. Some people call it determinant. Some people put little absolute value bars on it because in some ways determinant is a size. Some people just skip the brackets when they take the determinant and put the absolute value bars on it like that. So this is AD minus BC. You've used that before in a cross product. So we have here is R cos squared squared theta minus negative R sine squared theta. And that's where I get the R for the transformation from rectangular to polar. The Jacobian is the universal U substitution in a sense, or U substitution in multiple dimensions in steroids. The Jacobian is how we pay for switching from one coordinate to another. We didn't want to call it Jacobian back when you were learning U substitution because we thought that was too intimidating. So we just called it a U substitution. But the Jacobian transforms one region into another. It pays for the switching from one coordinate system to another with this determinant of the partial derivatives of the variables involved. So we would write this in a double integral like this. If I was integrating f of x and y with respect to area described by x and y, over region G, and I wanted to describe that in another coordinate system, same region G, but I want to describe X as some function of variables U and V, and Y as some function of variables U and V. And I wanted to rewrite this area element as du dv, an area element in u and v. And all I have to do is evaluate the function at this parameterizations g and h. I'm going to have to change the description of g to become description of u and v. But now I'm going to switch to a different color. I have to pay for that switch with the Jacobian that I calculate for U and V. And 
I have to take the absolute value of this. This pen is running out of ink. Okay, for another red pen, I have to take the absolute value of this. In part, because as you learned when you did determinant or box product, that what you could do is you could have a positive or negative result in the determinant. But you don't want to switch the sense of the value of the double integral. Now you did that when you did U substitution by sometimes switching the upper and lower limits. And that's why I said you had to be careful with how you switch limits when you do a U substitution, right? Sometimes limits in the other part came upside down. So that accounted for a change. But when you take this determinant here, the determinant could be positive or negative depending on the values of the variables and the order they're presented. So the absolute value of the Jacobian, the Jacobian is kind of like telling you a scaling factor and it's a little more than that, but the absolute value just keeps everything described as you see it without worrying about changing the sign of one or more of the steps in the integration. You could also do this in triple integral. I use G for region and G for triple integral. I'm gonna suppress the variables right now. I'll just say if I describe in terms of one variable system, X, Y, and Z, I could switch to another variable system. Let's call it U, V, and W. With the same function evaluated U and V and W, as long as I insert the scaling factor, the transformation factor called the Jacobian. But if I went to three variables, be careful about how I describe that transformation factor. It'll be the determinant of a three by three matrix. How X changes with respect to U, how X changes with respect to V, how X changes with respect to W, then how Y changes with respect to U, how Y changes with respect to V, and how Y changes with respect to W, then how Z changes with respect to U, how Z changes with respect to V, and how Z changes with respect to W. And this could be a monster calculation right here. For example, when you move from dx, dy, dz, you should have fun calculating this to d rho, d phi, d theta. If you worked out these nine partial derivatives and took the determinant, if you worked out older notation, the derivative of x, y, and z with respect to rho, phi, and theta. That's what the Jacobian is. Then you'd find the rho squared sine phi that we insisted you use when you change to spherical coordinates. Now you can use this for any arbitrary change of coordinates. So let's see <coughs> if we can do it for the change of coordinates in the problem we just demonstrated. Let's modify the problem we just demonstrated and say, I'm gonna take that region, but I'm gonna slightly alter where it sits. Let's take, I'm trying to blow this up to be a very large size. How large of a size I need to be compromising on. Let's not make it too large because I could get in trouble for that. Here, let's draw the curve through one, one. 
Let's do x times y equals one like this. Let's draw the curve through two, two. Let's call it x times y equals four. And x times y equals four would give me a result of four and one, or give me a result opposite up here called one and four. So here's the generic hyperbola through those points. Here's a generic hyperbola. Now this one's gonna go through two and one half and one half and two. So this is the generic hyperbola x times y equals one. I'm slightly altering the problem we did a second ago, the region we did a second ago. But now instead of from one to two, nicely cut off on the y-axis, what if I cut this off on a line through the origin, like y equals one fourth x? And what if I cut this off on this line right here? y equals one times x. Let's let this be my region. I could make it goofier, but this is goofy enough to start with. Let's let x times y range from one to four. And let's let x minus y or y over x, look at this line, y equals x, y equals one fourth x, what do they have in common that they're both straight lines through the origin? But what I have is a ratio of y to x equals one here, and a ratio of y to x equals one fourth here. Let's work out the area of this region. Or if I attached a density function to it, let's say similar to the density function from the previous problem. If I attached a density function to this, could I work out the mass of this region? Well, the thing that's awkward about this region, I can see it, I can describe it, very nicely with these four curves, but I can't integrate it nicely because I have, either way I shoot it, multiple entries, multiple exits. I have to at least just break this down into two integrals, two double integrals. If I had cast this line rather up here, I would have to break it down into several multiple integrals, no matter how I shot it. You know, a top, a medium, and a bottom. These limits are going to be extremely awkward in what? In the x, y coordinate system. So could I invent other coordinates to describe this region? and then evaluate the integral with respect to those coordinates using a coordinate transformation. So what's a more friendly coordinate system for this region? Well, I'd like to set my limits to be constants, right? And I already have a site of what they could be right here. Like x times y goes from one to four. Maybe x times y should be a variable. And then I could just let that x times y go from one to four. 
Here I had y equals x, y equals one fourth x. But I thought, well, if you gather the y and the x together by dividing y over x equals one, y over x equals one fourth, that could be a constant limit from one fourth to one. What if I let v be y over x? And I could just let v range from one fourth to one. Now this is a beautiful plan, constant limits right here, right? But the problem is I have to pay for this. So let's draw a picture of not the XY universe, but let's draw a picture over here of the UV universe. I don't wanna redraw the XY up top, but for the sake of the presentation, I think I'm going to do it very quickly. But my region up here is the master drawing. So I know how to take X and Y and create U and V. And that gives me beautiful solid limits in the UV plane. U goes from one to four. And V goes from one quarter to one. Now for the sake of argument, I changed the scale on the V just for the sake of my drawing. So notice that this isn't truly a square over here. This is actually one fourth to one, if I use the same units, a thin rectangle. But I want to display something I can see right here. Let's call this region R. Let's call this region S. I want to describe this region and I want to see it. So I expanded the V axis. The problem is I have to know the price of switching from X, Y to U and V. I need to know partial X, partial U, partial X, partial V, partial Y, partial U, and partial Y, partial V. I need to know the determinant of that matrix. So I need to have a description of X and Y in terms of U and V. I need to turn these descriptions inside out. I have to solve for X and Y in terms of U and V. So I need, and where am I gonna get it? Formulas for X and Y in terms of U and V. So I'm gonna have to do some algebra right here. Maybe I can do some U substitution. Maybe I could, well, not U substitution. Maybe I could just do some straight substitution. Let's say Y is equal to V times X. So if I insert that into here and I get U is equal to V times X squared. So I get X squared is U over V or X is the square root of U over the square root of V. I'm gonna use the fractional powers to help me differentiate because I'm going to have to differentiate anyway and I don't want to think about quotient rules. Or if x is equal to u one half v one half then dividing by x says v is equal to y divided by x u one half v minus one half. 
So what is that? V gives you one half, V minus one half. That's equal to Y. And this is V to the one. So this is U one half, V one half. This is the description of how to move from the S universe to the R universe, from the UV universe to the XY universe. And this is gonna give me my Jacobian. And this is gonna set up my coordinate transformation. So now let's calculate the Jacobian. And we have to do this kind of quickly. So what I have right here is this integral in the R universe that I find uncomfortable to do. Let's just do area for a moment. We could come back and do mass. It's uncomfortable to do because I don't know how to easily describe the X and Y limits. I'm going to recast that as an integral over a simpler region in a new coordinate system. But in order to do that, you could say I'm integrating one if I'm just looking for area. In order to do that, I have to pay for the switch by inserting the Jacobian that describes those variables. I have to pay for this switch by saying partial x, u, sorry, partial x, partial y, partial uv, absolute value, du dv. So let's see how obnoxious this partial is gonna turn out to be. So partial x, partial u. Here's my Jacobian. Here's my coordinate transformation. Partial x, partial u is what now? One half u to the minus one half, v to the minus one half. Partial x partial v is minus one half u to the one half v to the minus three halves. So I wrote this in powers. Partial y partial u is one half u to the minus one half v to the one half. Partial y partial v is one half u to the one half v to the minus one half. The determinant of this. When I multiply, I get good things happening with these powers. The u to the minus one half, the u to the one half is just u to the zero. The v to the minus one half and v to the minus one half multiplied together is v to the minus one. So I get one half of v to the minus one. And then I have to subtract this direction. So it's gonna be subtraction, gonna make this positive. Oh, I get one half times one half, don't I? So I get one fourth when I'm done with that. Here I get positive one fourth because I'm subtracting the negative. And here the U's cancel out and the V's are also minus one. We're gonna to have to see how that works out. So u to the power is zero, v to the power minus one. Okay. So here's my Jacobian. A quarter of one over v and a quarter of one over v is one over two v. That's the price I have to pay for switching coordinate systems. I just want to check my derivatives before I execute this to make sure I did with respect to u, then with respect to v. Yes. And with respect to u, then with respect to v, so far so good. So now, what's the area of that region r? It's the double integral over s of one over two v u dv. 
Now I have to set the U and V limits according to this picture, but that's very direct because I have the constant limits. Let's set the V limits from one fourth to one. Let's set the U limits from one to four. And let's integrate one half, one over V to U dV. Now with respect to U, this is just a constant. So I get U times this constant from four to one. Remember, I'm integrating a constant over an interval. The length of the interval is three, so I get three times the constant. And now I integrate this with respect to V, excuse me. So this is just three times this constant because I'm integrating with respect to U. And this is constant with respect to U. Now I integrate with respect to V, so I'm gonna get a natural log of V. Absolute value necessary, right? But V is only positive, so I don't worry about the absolute value. Absolute value of V is V. Get three halves out front. And now I gotta do this from one fourth to one. And now I have natural log of one is zero, natural log of one fourth. So I have three halves, natural log of one fourth. And I'm supposed to subtract the two. And you're nervous to have a negative area, right? But remember, natural log of one fourth is negative. This is four to the minus one. So you could take the minus one out front and you could say this is three halves times a natural log of four. The area of this region is three halves times the natural log of four. I'm just curious what that is. And we're reaching the end of our time, but just let me type in three halves natural log four, stop, 2.079 approximately. Let's go back to this region up here. I didn't do the mass, I just did the area. But the area of this region is 2.079 approximately. Now, I could block that out. Remember each one of these bricks right here that I draw would be area one. So I could decide if that looks like it adds up to a little more than two. Do you see how this region touches six one unit blocks? But if I added these regions together, I'm definitely going to get more than one. When I add these two blocks, I'm going to get other things here. I'm not sure how I've drawn it, but it's, it's believable. It's quite possible that this region is a little more than two units, two squares. Think of melting down this red thing into little square nuggets. Okay, we didn't describe that beautifully. In fact, up here, I think I have to emphasize that I'm changing one region into another region entirely, an easier region to describe. But this is the overall presentation. You take a region that's awkward to set limits for, and if you choose a reasonable transformation, you can create a region that's easy to set limits for. And you're welcome to do that as long as you pay for the transformation by computing the Jacobian. Notice the Jacobian here was not a constant. And if you insert the Jacobian into your new regions integral, then you have nicer limits you might have more work to do inside here, but you'll create a multiple integral, double or triple, that matches your original messy multiple integral. Okay, I spent a little too much time on that mass having fun problem. So next week, you're just practicing and getting ready for the exam. I think we'll do some more examples, or maybe you'd like to do more examples while we're working next week of coordinate transformations and Jacobians so that I could present that in a slightly less hurried fashion.
I'm going to stop my recording.